rationalism or mysticism? What is the Iranian mystic Mahmoud Shabastari's view towards these two methods of acquiring knowledge? How does Shabastari distinguish the double meaning of the Persian word tafakkur in his poetry? How does he distinguish rational reflection and mystical contemplation? Was Shabastari an anti-rationalist, a strict fideist? In this video, I examine Shabastari's thought about mysticism and rationalism in the context of the thought of great thinkers like Plato, Plotinus, St. Augustine, Meister Eckhart, Ibn Arabi, and Ibn Rushd or Averroes. حکیم فلسفی چون هست حیران نمی بیند ز اشیاء غیر امکان ز امکان می کند اثبات واجب از این حیران شدن در ذات واجب ظهور جمله اشیاء به ضد است ولی حق را نمانند و نه ند است چون نود ذات حق را ضد و همتا ندانم تا چگونه داند او را ندارد ممکن از واجب نمونه چگونه داندش آخر چگونه ذهن نادان که او خورشید تابان به نور شم جوید در بیابان now let's analyze this poetic passage. All right, let us break down the main points of the paper. I will uh, put the paper's link in the description. So for those of you who want to read the paper, uh, you can access it easily. The name is Mystical Contemplation or Rational Reflection. The double meaning of tafakkur in Shavastari's Rose Garden Mystery, that is Golshan and Roz, and this is how it is written in Persian. So basically, there is only one word, tafakkur, but Shavastari derives two different meanings from it. One, philosophical reflection, and the other one, mystical contemplation, as I have translated it. In Persian language, the word tafakkur is the same. All right, the content of this video. Um, I, I will not dwell so much on biography and background because I have done that so many times in the previous videos. Um, so we will go through research purpose, literature gap, objectives, overview, reflection in Golshan, that is the Rose Garden of Mystery, the book, contemplation in Golshan. Then we're going to analyze whether Shabasteri was a fides, an anti-rationalist. And then we're going to put his thought in the context, in the traditional context, and historical context. And by tradition, I mean hadith, prophetic sayings, and Quranic verses. And by historical background, I mean that I will be putting it in the context of ancient Greek, Neoplatonist, medieval Christian, and Islamic metaphysics. We're going to analyze its contextual fit and credibility. Finally, we will analyze Shavastari's relevance today, and we will conclude the points. Very quick biography. His name was Sheikh Mahmoud Shabastari, full name here, Iranian, born in 687, Hijri, in Shabastar city, near Tabriz, Iran, that it still exists today and um, is almost connected to Tabriz now because of the population increase. He got his education in Tabriz, started traveling, saw many, many masters in different countries, different cities. His death is controversial. It's either 720 or 740 Hijri. His thought reflects Ibn Arabi's hikmah, that is theosophy, and his poetic style is similar to Rumi and Attar to other Persian mystic poets, Sufi poets. Now, this paper's objectives. I aim to answer the following three questions. In the Rose Garden of Mystery, how does the Shabastari distinguish mystical contemplation and rational reflection in pursuing divine knowledge? Two, was Shabastari a strict fideist and anti-rationalist? Number three, how does Shabastari's position align with the following mystic philosophers' thought? Plato, Plotinus, St. Augustine, Meister Eckhart, Ibn Rushd or Averroes, and Ibn Arabi. The key commentaries we have used are Shamsuddin Muhammad Lahiji, this is, this is the commentator, and the works are by these commentators. Uh, Maulana Shah Mahmoud Da'i Shirazi, Ibn Turki Esfahani, and um, Mullah um, Muhammad Ibrahim Sabzewari. These are the top commentaries concerning the Golshan. Now, research purpose and literature gap. Well, it is a religious obligation for believers to know God, with thinking, that is tapakkur, being the means to acquire such knowledge. This is why the first question 
that the Khurasani mystic asks Shabastari is pertains to the nature of the Fakur. So the Khurasani mystic, we, we, we have discussed this in our previous videos. A mystic sends Shabastari a letter containing several questions. The first question pertains to the nature of thought, justifying this, research, this researcher's focus. So um, the, the problem with the literature concerning Golshan is that the, the, the literature primarily focuses on literary aspect, neglecting the philosophical and mystical concepts and deep critical analysis. So, but a thorough understanding requires examining these concepts in the broader context of Islamic thought, which will inspire for research. And not just Islamic thought, but we could also put it in the context of, like I said, uh, medieval Christian, Neoplatonist, and Greek thought to see what comes out of it. Now, this is the question that Hiravi asks Shabastari. First, in wonder of my own thoughts, I dwell. What is that which they call thinking? Basically, Hiravi is asking about the nature of thought. What, what, what is thought? What, what is this thing that they call thinking? Let us start with an overview of Shabastari's um, perspective. Um, so for Shabastari, knowledge acquisition methods are divided into two. One is rational reflection, that is reasoning, and the other one is unveiling, or as they call it in Farsi and Arabic, kashf. Um, so Shabastari defines tafakkur in two senses. One in a philosophical sense, uh, through reasoning, and the other one in a mystical sense, uh, that is through unveiling, through intuition. Um, so the first type, that is the definition of a tapakkur in a mystical sense, we call contemplation. I will not repeat this. So the, the definition of tafakkur in a philosophical, rational sense, I will call reflection. So let's see what contemplation is. Tafakkur, in a mystical sense, is a profound intuitive journey, transcending logic and reason, ultimately realizing that there is no real other than the real, that is God. It necessitates a focused and attentive consideration of spiritual or philosophical matters, often involving a state of mystical awareness of a higher power or God's being, achieved through steady meditation and private devotion. Reflection, or tafakkur in a rational sense, is basically discursive thought. It's logic-based. It is the general sense of uh, thinking that we use. Now, let us start with Shabisteri's poetry. Now, reflection in Golshan, philosopher's definition. First, he's going to outline what philosophers mean by, by, uh, by, by reflection, by tafakkur in a rational sense. He says, Seeking an unknown, one conceives related concepts in a particular order, principles that they may have been forgotten or neglected. This conception, tasabur, is a mental form, that is surat, that manifests in the heart. In its initial appearance, yet unexamined, this appearance is called a recollection or tafakkur. So this is basically what he means here in this in this line. You bring some concepts, you conceive them as forms without without examining. You're, we're going to start examining in this unexamined stage. It's called a recollection. Then he says, "Vazu chom bogzari hingam fikrat, povat nami veyandar orf ibrat." Recollection alone is insufficient. This explanation, not literal translation. So the person must leave behind the apparent form of concepts. And this is what he calls a breath, like passing by the normal conception. So we are moving towards examination. So the person must carefully deliberate, that is, tadabur, them, that is the concepts, conceptions, ideas, to arrive at the unknown. Rationalists call this careful deliberation a tafakkur or reflection. So there we have it, the philosopher's definition. We conceive them, we pass by the conceptions, we examine them carefully, 
in particular orders through the rules of philosophy and broad logic, and that is what he calls tafakkur in a rational sense. One of the questions the Khurasani mystic asks Shabestari is this interesting question, Why is reflection sometimes praised in Islam and other times prohibited? And Shabestari says, well, دلالا فکر کردن شرط را هست ولی در ذات حق محض گناه هست Reflecting on divine blessings is, uh, is necessary if you want to walk in a mystical journey in the journey towards God But the reflecting, thinking about the real essence is prohibited um, What does he mean by this? Here, the commentator Lahiji comes in. He says, well, by blessings, Shavastari means divine names, qualities, and acts through which God bestows the gift of existence. So, additionally, blessings are the signs and mirrors reflecting their benefactor. And um, so, why thinking about these signs, why thinking about these blessings is encouraged, is praised, well, um, the commentator relates to, refers to this chronic verse. Chapter 14, verse 7, If you give thanks, I shall surely grant you an increase, says God. So when you think about all these signs, the names, the qualities, their manifestations in the world, the, the mirrors that reflect their benefactor, you look at a beautiful mountain, you look at the, the, the ocean, you look at the sky, and from there quite a teleological picture here for those who are familiar with philosophy. Um, so when you look at them, you from there you, 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 you conclude that there is a creator. You think about their benefactor and you give thanks. I mean, again, thanks. God says, I shall surely grant you an increase, an increase in your knowledge in this context. That's what Shavastari means in, in this line. Uh, then Shavastari repeatedly refers to reason's limitations. Um, for he criticizes philosophers' focus on the possible. He says, well, when you are focusing on the possible, you are stuck in a vicious circle or in an in infinite regress. Philosophers are stuck trying to prove, quotations, prove things, that they neglect divine unity and multiplicity. Then in this radical verse, he says, Zahi nadan ke u taban. Alas, the foolish one who yearns, the radiant sun with the candle's light discerns, in boundless desert, seeking truth and sight, with feeble flame against the sun's own might. It says, basically, uh, um, if I simplify this, this, this poetic translation of mine, it says, um, alas, the fool who is trying to, is trying to look for the sun in the bright desert where, where, where the sun is obvious through the light of a candle. Then he's going to give us a very interesting line, but, but to understand it, we need to uh, get into a detour. In Sufism, the archangel Gabriel uh, symbolizes reason. Um, so according to Islamic narratives, in the night of ascent, when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu, um, ascended to the skies, Gabriel was with him throughout this journey. But after a certain point, Gabriel stops. He says, well, if I take another step, my wings would burn out. And here, Shabasteri is playing with that. He says, look, in, in, in Sufism, Gabriel symbolizes reason. In that realm where, where the real radiant light guides the way, what space remains for Gabriel's words to sway? What does what does it mean? It says, look, reason can only get you so far. After a certain point, you cannot walk with reason. You need a higher faculty, which we will discuss. But so far, he's pointing to reason's limitations. So the night of ascent, Gabriel's inability to walk further symbolizes reason's limitations for Shavestari. In another work called Saadat Nome. Uh, Shavastari severely criticizes philosophy and Greek logic. He says wisdom initially was bestowed upon prophets, starting with Seth and Enoch or Idris, as we say in Arabic and Persian. 
Then knowledge spread to Greece, where it was, quote, adopted and modified. The once pure knowledge mixed with ignorance, he says, disbelief, misguidance, alteration, and distortion. He says Plato's followers, um, him like and his followers, led to misguided philosophies. He criticized Aristotle and his followers for misuse of logic. And by misuse of logic, he's emphasizing the limitations of logic and reason in understanding truth and divinity. Then he says a simple, pure heart is much, much better than intellectual prowess. A simple heart is better than intellectuality, rational thinking. He emphasizes a spiritually centered approach to wisdom and understanding. Further in his poems, he says, and here Sabzawari Khorasani adds insightful comments together with Lahiji, says the realization of the impossibility of knowing the real's unlimited essence through reason is a critical insight, marking the station of bewilderment. In Sufism, uh, there is this point, many, many Sufis have talked about this, including Ibn Arabi. Um, when through rational thinking, you get to a level that you are stuck, you are bewildered, you are in awe. That is the point where we need a higher faculty. We need mystical knowledge. We need mystical approaches to, to, to walk further. And that's what Shavastari means here. He concludes that uh, the journeyer must transcend the limitations of logic. And in this process, there is a great need for divine guidance. So you should pray to God to guide you throughout the process. Now, the second category, that is the second meaning of tafakkur, that is contemplation, uh, tafakkur in a mystical sense, contemplation in Golchandras. Shavastari says, tafakkur raftan az batil suye haq bejuz van dar bedidan kulli mutlaq. This is the definition of um, contemplation that Shavastar is giving us. He says, a journey from the unreal to the real, from multiplicity and determination to unity, from the exterior to the interior, from form to meaning. And this contemplation involves seeing the absolute whole in particulars. The goal of this journey is annihilation in God, that is fanaifillah, and union with the divine essence. It is a hidden path involving soul or heart purification, ascetic practices, constant mindfulness of God, and spiritual journeying. In a very beautiful line, he says, You are the copy of the divine design. Seek everything you wish in yourself. This is a, basically a paraphrase of uh, a poetic verse from, um, from Rumi's poetry. This contemplation is an introspection in understanding one's true essence, that is, one's being created, or one's having been created in God's image. This introspection is a similar theme in Neoplatonism. For example, in the Ennauts, uh, Plotinus talks about the center of the soul, a spaceless point where the soul meets and unites with the one. Even in uh, Plotinus's account, and many other mystic philosophers' account, the divine journey is an introspective one. And that is what we understand from these two lines that we have examined so far in discussing contemplation on Gorshan. Then he says, A heart that receives light and purity from knowledge. And I emphasize from knowledge. Hold this in your mind, we will discuss this. First sees God in everything. For Shavastari, human endeavor alone is insufficient. There should be divine light. The divine light must approve the journey. Thus, pulling these things together, um, the contemplation in Golshan, that is tafakkur in a mystical sense, is a profound intuitive journey transcending logic and reason, ultimately realizing that there is no real, real being other than the real God. Now, one of the important questions we set up um, uh, we set off to answer was whether Shavastari was a strict fideist because so far we have seen that he's criticizing reason and philosophers like severely. Here, the, so the question naturally comes up, was he, anti, was he an anti-rationalist, a strict fideist? I will argue, and I have proof from his texts, that despite severe criticisms of reason, a closer examination shows us that he supports both reason and spirituality in pursuing divine knowledge. This is 
a poem um, that saves him from being a strict fetist. He says, well, with reason alone, after some point, you are lost. But, he says, then he brings this poem. Vagar nuri resat az alam jan, ze feze jazbeya az akse burhan, delash ba lutf haq ham raz gerdad, az an rahi ke amad baz gerdad. Ze jazbe ya ze burhan haqiqi, rahi yabad be iman haqiqi. The translation goes, if a light comes from the world of spirit, from the overflow of ecstasy or reflection of reasoning, his, that is, the journeyer, his heart becomes the confidant of the real's grace. He returns through the path he had come, that is, in the first place. From the ecstasy or real reasoning, he finds his way to true belief. So, as you can see here, he's defining two ways. One is ecstasy. That is spiritual selflessness, spiritual intoxication, drunkenness, that you are epistemically, not ontologically, this is a widely misunderstood concept that people think in Fana Villa, you existentially like get annihilated and disappear and get destroyed. That is not the case. Um, the reason uh, Fana Villa is symbolized as drunkenness is that a, a drunk person um, is not aware of the situation that he or she is in. That's why in mystical ecstasy, the person is not aware of even his or her own existence. That's why they call it drunkenness or intoxication. So basically two ways, one, ecstasy, then reasoning. But here is a, the curious part. In poem, he says, Zefeze jazbeya as akseburhan. That is, from the overflow of ecstasy or reflection of reasoning. And this word reflection shows us that, yeah, well, reflection basically means an imperfect copy of something, right? So here he's considering reasoning inferior to ecstasy. So for him, first comes spirituality, then comes rational reflection. Uh, in this slide, I have discussed the terms, but that is too much for this presentation. Um, the, I have brought basically, um, I'm analyzing this translation, this ver these verses, because this is the central passage that saves him from, from being a strict fetish. Uh, I've examined it word by word, putting the poem in the context of several famous commentaries. Um, you can pause the video, check it, it's too much to discuss here, or read the paper where I discuss this point um, extensively. Uh, here it's just general presentation, but in the poem I have uh, elaborated this part completely. Uh, so the poem's analysis, um, the, the two of the commentators have um, explained this poem. So Daishi Razi says, through either ecstasy or reasoning, the divine light illuminates the journeyer's heart, bestowing upon her the gift of knowledge. This guidance enables the individual to develop an affinity for and engagement with the spiritual realm. Consequently, through prayers in solitude, she, the journeyer, can turn away from the material world of multiplicity and towards the divine unity from which she has originated. Now, the, the second, um, I think, a better interpretation is from Sabzawari Khurasani. So, uh, alternatively, he posits that the light of knowledge, remember how in in other words, I said, pay attention here. He says, Deli arifat nuru a heart that receives light and purity from knowledge. So it is from knowledge that you receive light and purity in Shabbos thought. I said, consider this line, now bring it here with that mentality. So this interpretation, that's why I said, is one of the reasons it shows that this interpretation is better because it fits better with Shabbos thought. Here, knowledge grants you that light, that purity that the light of knowledge appears through either ecstasy or reason. When a journeyer experiences the ecstasy, they acquire intelligible forms from the active intellect. This process occurs as the intellective soul, or as we call heart in Islamic metaphysics, which Khurasani likens to a mirror tarnished by worldly desires, is purified through ascetic practices derived from the divine law. That is Riyazat al-Shar'i in Farsi. And this, uh, the, the, the readers of Plotinus uh, must be smiling right now because this is exactly what Plotinus also tells us. 
about the, the tarnished mirror, about purification through ascetic practices and spiritual self-discipline. So basically, you have to go through ascetic practices, spiritual self-discipline, mujahidat in Farsi. As the heart becomes cleansed, the mystic can focus on a particular subject and answers manifest within their hearts without the need for deliberation or discursive thought. This transformative process highlights the superiority of the spiritual way in Islamic mysticism when compared to reason as a means of acquiring knowledge. As you can see, this interpretation is more comprehensive and aligns much, much better with, um, with Shabbat's general thought. Now, historical and traditional context, as I promised. There are hadith or narratives, sayings, prophetic sayings, or uh, in Shi'i case, um, the, the narratives from the 12 Imams um, that illuminate this matter. I'm not going to be discussing all of them here, but two of them, both from Shia Sunni sources. This one is from, from Sahih Muslim Sunni source, and this one is from Sul al Kafi Shi'i source. This is the claim that I have, and through these uh, these narratives and chronic verses, I will I will substantiate this uh, claim. Uh, I am arguing in this paper that Shabastari's position is going too much. He's going too far with uh, distancing himself from reason. So in Islamic tradition, reason and spirituality are two wings in the spiritual journey. He's denigrating reason too much. Yes, in Sufi context, it may make sense, but generally in Islamic context, in Islamic tradition, it does not. So the Prophet Muhammad, um, peace be upon him, says, let those of you who are most wise and possessing intellect be closest to me than those who come after them and be aware of the tumult of the marketplace. So this hadith underscores the significance of wisdom and intellect in seeking proximity to profit and cautions against distractions of worldly affairs. So clearly, here we have a reference for uh, wisdom, knowledge, intellect, reflection, thinking. And there are hundreds of narratives like this. From a Shi'i text uh, from uh, Imam Muhammad al-Baghir, um, the fifth Shi'i Imam, peace be upon him, he says, a scholar who benefits from his knowledge is better than 70,000 worshippers. So this hadith emphasizes the value of reason in attaining divine knowledge and suggests that acquiring knowledge in itself is a form of worship and actually higher than 70,000 worshippers act. So an intellectual, knowledge-based life is better than a monastic, strictly pious one. Now, uh, several chronic verses will also help us here. For example, in uh, chapter 10, verse 100, we have, He, God, lays defilement upon those souls who understand not. So this verse emphasizes the importance of reason and understanding and avoiding spiritual defilement. He says, he lays defilement upon those souls who understand not. Clearly, we are talking about uh, comprehension, reasoning, reflection. That is how important it is. In the third chapter, these verses, we have truly in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the variations of the night and the day are signs for those who pos are signs for possessors of intellect who reflect, I emphasize, Upon the creation of the heavens and the earth, our Lord, thou hast not created this in vain. Glory be to thee. So this chronic verse encourages believers to use reason and intellect to reflect upon the creation of the universe. Chapter 39, verse 9 says, Are those who know equal to those who do not know? Again, emphasizing the superiority of knowers, those who gain knowledge, those who reflect, those who comprehend. Now, uh, we also have like spirituality in Quranic verses. For example, in uh, chapter 41, verse 53, we have, we shall show them our signs upon the horizon and within themselves till it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. So this verse under, underscores the importance of seeking divine knowledge and truth so through reflection and introspection. Look Look at this the initial part of this verse. It says we shall show them our signs upon the horizon Basically in the external world. So you can use your thinking you can use your reflection 
to, to about and use your ref reflection to get to these science benefactors use your reason to put it shortly and then it says within themselves what is within you is related to your soul related to your heart so it, it's an introspective sign so it's motivating you to use both re reflection and introspection Chapter 6, verse 125 says, Whomsoever God wishes to guide, he expand his chest for submission. Expand his chest, metaphysical, spiritual. And whomsoever he wishes to lead astray, because of their insistence on sin, he makes his chest narrow and constricted. Again, this verse emphasizes the receptiveness of one's heart to divine guidance. And this heart is not the physical heart that we are having. This is the spiritual metaphysical sense of the heart that uh, those uh, who read Islamic metaphysics are only too well aware. Chapter 18, verses 65, 66. This is a, a chronic passage about Prophet Moses. Um, while they were journeying somewhere, they, were, they found a servant among other servants whom we have thought knowledge from our presence. So you see, God says there was a servant among our servants whom we thought, whom, whom we thought from our presence. Mystical sense. Um, many, many commentators have said that they, this, uh, this verse refers to um, another prophet, that is Prophet Khedr. But anyway, that's not the point. The point is the mystical knowledge approach here. So Moses said unto him, Shall I follow thee? that thou might teach me some of which thou has been taught out sound judgment that you have been taught this verse emphasizes the importance of learning from spiritually enlightened individuals now as you can see we have chronic verses for both reason and spirituality there is a balance and this balance is quite obvious in the hadith tradition, in the Quranic tradition, in philosophy, and even in mysticism itself. Even in, uh, well, some Sufis take it too much, but that doesn't reflect and represent the tradition. Even there are Sufis who are having a balanced approach. But how do we know that? For that, we need to get into a historical approach. To analyze this historical story, I started from Plato. Then I will come to Neoplatonism, medieval Christian Islamic thought, but I think these explanations are too much for this video. We can do two things. Either you can pause the video for each figure. This is a summary of what they think. You can read that or go to the paper. I have discussed it, discussed these points from these philosophers' perspective extensively. And I have added many footnotes that they can also help you better with understanding the text. So I'm going to quietly scroll through these slides so that those who want to read, they can easily read it. Now, assuming that you are now familiar with these thinkers' thought, that how balanced they were about uh, the war between mysticism and philosophy, between rational reflection and mystical contemplation. Uh, let's analyze Shavastari's contextual fit and credibility. Shavastari's emphasis on spirituality and reason's limitation generally reflects Sufi perspective. Thus, and this is credible to some extent to the personal and introspective nature of because of the personal and introspective nature of divine knowledge pursued within Sufi tradition, to some extent. But his extreme criticism of reason sets him apart from other thinkers who adopt a more moderate stance. Shavastari's view may not fully align with the Quran and Hadith, examples of which we already saw. Shavastari is not a strict fideist and anti-rationalist. However, and this is my complaint, a more balanced approach to reason and spirituality could better align his view with the broader Islamic tradition. He has gone too much, so much so that he gets basically beyond the borders of the tradition. Okay, having learned these, uh, what is Shaustari's relevance today? 
So as Therese Relmistre lies in his account of contemplation and reflection providing contemporary individuals with the valuable guidance in their quest for the divine knowledge and personal development. In an increasingly complex and material-driven world, achieving harmonious equilibrium between rationality and spirituality is essential. Shavastari's approach fosters introspection, self-awareness, and critical thinking, empowering individuals to forge deeper connections with their inner selves and the divine while addressing modern challenges with greater clarity and discernment. Moreover, his holistic approach to personal growth and the pursuit of divine knowledge demonstrate that intellectual inquiry can extend beyond rationalism and encompasses mysticism. This is a fine, fine point. I'm going to repeat that part. His holistic approach to personal growth and the pursuit of divine knowledge demonstrates that intellectual inquiry can extend beyond rationalism and encompass mysticism, bridging the perceived incongruity between religion on the one hand and, and positivist materialism and scientific inquiry on the other. By integrating philosophy and mysticism, Shavastari's teachings remain highly relevant for those navigating the complexity of the modern world while remaining grounded in the spiritual and intellectual endeavor. Uh, here, as you're aware from the previous slides, a more balanced uh, combination of mysticism and philosophy will do this, not the extreme level that Shavastari took it to. Conclusion. Considering the historical context, pursuing divine knowledge necessitates harmonious integration of reason and spirituality. This is important, pay attention here, because this is part that I did not read. Uh, so here is, um, you will hear about Plato, Plotinus, Eckhart, Augustine, Ibn Arabi, and Ibn Rushd thoughts shuffled. Philosophy in this context serves as a purification process that facilitates the soul's contemplation and ascent to the divine realm. Philosophy is a tool for profoundly comprehending and interpreting divine knowledge embedded within the religious text. A fine, fine point. The role of reason, specifically as manifested through dialectic thinking, is crucial in understanding the nature of things. This is Plotinus speaking. However, its limitations become evident when attempting to access divine knowledge and grasp the divine reality of the human being. Ibn Arabi speaking, despite these limitations, reason remains invaluable in offering insight into the divine. Simultaneously, spirituality fosters a deep connection, look, not just understanding, but a connection with the divine, allowing individuals to transcend the rational mind's constraints and experience divinity directly. A dialogue among traditions is important for a quest for divine knowledge. Future research could be exploring the impact of Ibn Arabi and Rumi and Shavistari's thought. Uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, his thought is colored by the thought of Ibn Arabi and Rumi. And that would be a nice research for future, for those of you who are looking for um, such research. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it helped you. If you have any questions, uh, drop it in the comment section or email me. I will uh, put the paper's link in the description. So for those of you who want to read the paper, uh, you can access it easily. Again, thank you very much for watching. I hope this video helps you in your academic and spiritual journeys.